Good morning everyone, welcome to our small footprint. My name is Nissa, and if you're new here, we are a family of eight who live off-grid in Australia. Every video I say that as like just a instinctual, I turn the camera on, that's what I start, and I wonder if I should change saying that. But anyway, it just comes out now when I open the camera and I start talking. So uh, today's video is to do with Kiva. So I've been asked to, to cover a few different things. One of the things is my sourdough starter. So I started a new starter about 10 days ago now so I've been tracking the progress of that I'm gonna do a test bake on it probably tomorrow and then I'll get that video up soon but the other thing I get asked about is kefir so uh, the we do milk kefir and I'm sure there's many pronunciations of this too this is just how I'm going to say it uh, but the kids don't tolerate dairy except that when they were a few years back when we were seeing an allergist getting allergy testing and stuff like that done he suggested trying some fermented dairy so we tried cow's milk yogurt instead of coconut milk yogurt and things like milk kefir which was great because coconut milk yogurt is expensive to make uh, so being able to make yogurt with uht milk has been wonderful I can have UHT milk sitting in the bottom of the cupboard and I can make two liters at a time whenever I feel like making it and then milk kefir is a bit the same so we can use the yogurt for things like smoothies and stuff like that but it's a fairly lengthy process to make yogurt and they like to eat it straight so what I tend to do is I make milk kefir for things like that so I will use that in my in their smoothies I use it in some baking as a milk replacement uh, and things like that and that has worked out really well. They don't drink it straight and I'm not real keen on it straight either but uh, it's, it goes in the fridge and we keep on processing it and using it at will. So the way we do our kefir is that we have a large jar, the kefir grains go in it, the milk goes in it, the jar sits on the bench until it starts to have that separation line then it goes in the fridge and then when we're ready to use it we strain it out and then we refeed the grains. It's pretty basic. So what I'm going over today though is the process, I'll show you how we do that but also we had a jar that went way way over fermented it didn't get put in the fridge so we made kefir cheese out of it so that's what I'm going to cover today amongst the whole process of making the kefir and things like that is that kefir cheese process as well so come along and see what we got done uh, and what we made with the kefir cheese and things like that and uh, enjoy So because we make the kefir in the three liter lots, so what works for us is that we have this big jar and it's a Kmart jar and it is uh, 3.8 liters, I think, the jar. And it fits in the bottom shelf of the fridge fine uh, and it fits a whole three liter milk in it, which is why we use this particular jar. So cow's milk, we don't, we buy UHT milk for yogurt, but cow's milk is one of the things that we do buy between shopping trips. Daryl buys a three liter probably weekly and this is its only purpose is to be used in uh, milk kefir. I do occasionally take some and use it for myself but it's rare. I'm so used to coconut milk now that it's really irrelevant but we mainly just buy it purely for uh, milk kefir so maybe one three litre jug a, a week uh, that we one three litre bottle from the shop that we buy. So someone has uh, strained this to use it and then has refed it and then has put it on the bench somewhere out of line of sight and I've discovered it probably 36 48 hours later it's very hot at the moment and it has completely split so you can see it's completely split words the curds and whey have completely split in the jar and it's now even if I strained it when you stick it in the fridge it's going to separate again because it's already got that separation but it's also going to be quite sour and it's just not really suitable for what we use it for which is smoothies and things like that so instead of uh, using it for that I decided to make kefir cheese so the first step of making kefir cheese is to strain your grains out because you want to reuse your grains. So the grains are what ferments the milk and they are what you keep as your continuous like mother basically. So you need to strain your grains out first. You need to use a soft or a, I suppose it wouldn't work fine. You just need to push the grains around in a colander making sure that you're getting all the kefir off them but without squishing the grains through it. It doesn't really matter. You can eat the grains. It's not an issue but you want to keep them so you just move it around and move it around so that all the kefir comes off the grains but it leaves the grains behind. Uh, once the grains are left behind you can use that to start your next lot of kefir. So the you want to firmly move them around the colander, get all the kefir off it, and then keep the grains as they are. Don't need to be too pedantic. Basically, you've got some fermented liquid on there already, and that fermented liquid is going to help ferment the next 
lot like sourdough starter or vegetables that you're fermenting if you're using a little bit of fermented liquid from the previous one it's going to speed up the next batch that's basically what happens i don't normally wash my jar either i normally just put the grain straight back in the jar and top it up with milk but because this one was so over fermented there was lots of bits of cheese and curd stuck around the edges of the jar and it's really hot at the moment so if i had that much excess fermented product in the jar it would have made this jar turn really fast so I decided I'd give it all a wash out no soaps or anything like that just a nice clean cloth straight out of the drawer scrubbed down and got all the solids off it so that that isn't going to impact the next fermentation once it is all cleaned out you put the strained grains back in the jar so you just tip those grains straight back into the jar and then you top it up with milk now I probably have far too many grains in this jar at the moment which is probably partly why it fermented so quickly you can put these grains in your smoothies and whiz them up or you can feed them to the chickens or whatever you want to do with them but the the a healthy kefir will grow more grains the grains will get larger and they will multiply uh, and so you will always if you're feeding your, your kefir well and everything else they'll always grow that you'll always end up with more uh, and Sometimes that's a good thing, like in the middle of winter when our nights get really cold, it's really hard to get the kefir to ferment, it can take a couple of days, and so the more grains that are in there, the quicker it's going to ferment theoretically in the cold weather, but in summer, I don't need very many in there because it's going, the heat is enough that it's going to ferment pretty quickly, so it's personal preference how many kefir grains you keep in there, you need to watch it and make sure that it doesn't go past where you want, you can discard them, you can give them away, whatever you want to do with them. So because the jar fits the three litre milk, that's what I... Put in there so i topped put the grains back in the clean jar put the three liters of milk in the in with the grains put the lid on it and then put it aside for however long it takes you can tell it's ready when you start to see a, a mild line of whey at the very top so the grains float to the top and then they separate very slightly from the bottom and that's when we would put it in the fridge to, to it doesn't completely stop the fermentation process but it slows it right down uh, you can strain it straight away then and refeed it but for us that's not feasible we would end up with too much kefir so we just put the jug the jar straight in the fridge and then when we're ready to use it that's when we strain it and refeed it so what we're left with is a quite sour product because it was over fermented with a lot of whey so you need to strain your whey out of your curds uh, i am using a flour sack tea towel these ones are the ones that i got from amazon and i adore these flour sack tea towels i use them for so many things they're a really good size they're a really tight weave when you uh, twist things they don't the threads don't stretch like if you've ever used like a chucks or something to uh, squeeze stuff out you find that if you squeeze it too hard the chuck separates the threads separate and then things more solids get through than you want so the these don't do that which is really good so I'm making one hell of a mess when I'm doing this because I wouldn't normally make this much cheese in a go uh, normally cheese is something that I make as a small portion for something rather than making it because I've over fermented it sort of thing so I've got a large quantity of whey and kefir that I'm working with here and I made a lot of mess so you just have to excuse that so the best way to strain it is with gravity realistically so you want to pour the whey through and get as much of the the initial whey off as possible but then what you want to do is you want to use gravity to to drip it basically uh, so the best thing to do is to hang that tea towel up above a bowl and let it the gravity strain it much like you would make greek yogurt or anything like that uh, i'm sure there's other cheeses that are made the ver very same way by straining them like that uh, i know that hard cheeses are mostly used with a cheese press because you're also compacting the cheese this particular case you're not compacting the cheese you just want to strain it so if you can find somewhere that you can hang it up uh, above a bowl so it can drain into a bowl that's your best bet uh, probably 24 hours to get it really nice and sort of crumbly and dry if that's what you're after more of like a feta texture but in our place I'm not going to leave anything out overnight not with the bugs and rodents and everything else and it's quite hot at the moment too so I just did it first thing in the morning and hung it all day and kept an eye on it and then pulled it in at night uh, so it just depends on what consistency you want is how long you could hang it for you could hang it in the fridge uh, it's going to be slower to to drain but it will drain in the fridge uh, but I don't really have anywhere in the fridge suitable for hanging something above a bowl especially not something this size so for me it was sort of just out during daylight hours and then brought in I have thought about getting a wine fridge or something because I thought that would be really cool for curing meats or curing cheeses and things like that and if I had that then I could probably hang something like this in there as well so maybe at some point but for now I just did it for the for the day so once you've strained it to where you want to strain it then you just need to scrape it out and put it in a bowl so you just scrape all of the solids that you can into 
a bowl and stick it in the fridge. So mine is sort of a cream cheese consistency, works, which works really well for me because the kids tend to spread it on things when we make cheese. But uh, it's, uh, so yeah, it end up sort of a cream cheese. But the longer you hang it, the drier it's going to be, the more crumbly it's going to be. So it just depends what sort of use you're going to make of it, I suppose, or how you want to use it. Uh, you can always introduce a bit of the whey back if you've got it too dry and mix the way through it and a lot of cream like if you're making a cream cheese with cow's milk you tend to blend the cheese uh, with something to create a smooth cheese I haven't done it with this but kefir is a lot less grainy than uh, a cream cheese made with acid in a in a cow's milk but you can blend it so that it ends up being like a smooth cream cheese if that's what you wanted as well it really just depends on what you're going to use it for uh, at this point there's no salt or anything added to it it is purely just like a sour creamy texture which is really nice even on its own once you've strained it you're left with a whole lot of whey so i stuck that in the fridge and then i've got a whole bunch of whey left you can use your whey in a myriad of ways you can use it in breads which is what i'll do with some of this as the liquid in a bread you can use it uh, you can feed it to the animals it's good for the animals you can use it on the garden uh, you can use it to soak things in other cheeses and stuff can be soaked in whey all that sort of thing the other thing you can do is soak your grains in it so i decided because i've got so much i would make uh, i would soak some oats so I put half a bag of oats, it's probably about 900, 800, 900 grams of oats into a bowl and then covered it with about a 50-50 mix of whey and water. I'm not going to be straining these, so I didn't want to go too heavy on the whey because it's quite sour. It does sweeten up though, it tends to bring this, the sugars out in the, the oats when you're soaking them or the grains. So I do find that it's not as sour in a soaked whey like that than it is straight up but anyway so i did a big bowl of oats put half half whey and water and soak them and left them at room temperature overnight if you're soaking your oats you really want to leave them at room temperature uh, if you refrigerate it then it's not going to have quite the same effect so um left the bowl somewhere safe with the lid on it overnight to soak to use it the next day uh the next day i Oh, I also put the rest of the whey into a jar and stuck that jar in the fridge to use. As I said, I'm probably going to use that for bread. I might pull that out to room temperature and then use that as liquid in some bread when I'm using up the new sourdough starter and stuff and do some testing with that. Uh, the next morning I decided to use, I used those oats. So I'm just going to show you how I use those oats. I made a baked oatmeal. Now the kids, I really would like them to like baked oatmeal, but so far they haven't been overly keen on it. So I'm trying to make it in a way that I think that they will like. So I threw it all together. I really didn't measure much of this because I'm still just figuring it out. But I used all the oats that were soaked. I didn't drain them. I added half a dozen eggs, probably could have added a couple more, uh, and then some shredded coconut, a handful of chocolate chips, um, a whole bunch of crushed peanuts. Uh, the chocolate chips are only added because they happen to be in the bag with the crushed peanuts, but that's neither here nor there. So, and some cinnamon, a little bit of sugar, and some peanut butter, and then just mixed it all through. So I was looking to replicate basically a chocolate peanut butter oatmeal type thing like how I make their porridge sometimes thinking that I could get it in a porridge bake but with those added eggs and things like that so I spread it out in the tray I did end up putting it between two different trays because when I put it in that tray I was a little concerned I didn't add any leavening agent because I was hoping to make this just sort of like a, a cooked porridge basically not a cake uh, and I it turned out fine. It was tasty. It was moist. It was, it was pleasant to, to eat. Uh, but the kids just weren't real enamored of it. But I do think it would be really nice in winter baked like this. And then with a scoop of yogurt on top, a bit of vanilla yogurt on top, I think that would work really well. So that's what I'm going to aim to do is next time I make yogurt, I'll do a baked oatmeal. And then we might try the yogurt served over the baked oatmeal. I think that that would be pleasant. I do like the idea of being able to put a baked oatmeal in the oven and walk away rather than spend 50 minutes making porridge of a morning because in winter it's negative temperatures in my kitchen and it's quite cold out there making porridge I do it but you know if I could get around not doing it then that would be cool too so still just experimenting with the baked oatmeal uh, and I suppose in winter we won't have the surplus of eggs so maybe it won't be something that I want to do so anyway we'll see how we go that's what I did with half the way this time anyway the kefir cheese is really good for pasta bake. So I decided that I was going to do something. I considered making a lasagna, except that I didn't have bolognese to frost it. I 
just I was flying by the seat of my pants as per normal. So what I decided to do was make some ravioli. So because I'm making the uh, the new starter, I've got a fair bit of uh, discard that I've been using in, in a variety of different things. And when I do the starter video, I'll show you a bunch of different things that I've made with the discard, some crepes and all sorts of things. But one of the things I did make was pasta because we really like sourdough pasta. And if the starter isn't particularly strong, it doesn't really matter. It's not going to impact the pasta at all. It's just not going to be quite as soft and silky. So I made up some pasta using the discard and then I decided to use it with some of this kiva cheese. So I did my normal, the, the pasta was fermented like it was made the day before, fermented for the day and then tossed in the fridge overnight and the next day I'm rolling it out. And I rolled it out and I decided to make raviol, ravioli. I don't make ravioli very often, it's very fiddly, uh, but... I decided that because I had the kefir cheese, which was unusual, I was going to do that. So I mixed the kefir cheese together with some garlic powder and some salt and just blended it with a spatula. Uh, you can add any sort of spices you want, any sort of herbs, anything you want, make it a herbed cheese. It's a bit like a cream cheese, so you can flavor it however you want. But I just added a bit of salt and garlic powder and it worked perfectly. It tasted fine. It tastes really good. Like it's, it's like a flavored cream cheese, to be honest. It really does just resemble a flavored cream cheese uh, so once I'd done that I rolled out the pasta sheets uh, into just rectangular lengths and then I dotted the cheese in even little half teaspoonfuls along the sheet of pasta placed the other sheet of pasta on top and starting from the middle and pushing outwards I tried to get as much air as possible out of the pasta now I used my wavy little cutter thing to cut the squares out because that will seal the edges as you're cutting it uh, so that works really well because you want to pinch those edges so if you're not doing something like that then you sort of want to use a fork around the edges or something along those lines to pinch those edges but you'll still get some that explode it just it just happens you end up with some exploding in the water no matter what you do I find no matter how careful you are uh, you knock them when you especially when it's sourdough pasta because it's so soft that you sometimes knock it with the spoon when you're tossing them around and things like that but uh, if you want to keep them as the little wavy thing works quite well to, to pinch those edges together as you're doing it uh, so I just went and did as much as I could I used about three quarters of the cheese before I gave up <laughs> uh, and then the and then just cut them all out and put them aside. If you dry them a little bit, that will also help with them staying together when you put them in the boiling water. And you want to bring the water to a boil and then place them gently in. I did them in batches so that I wasn't overcrowding them. And you want to cook them gently at a, at a, a good hard simmer, slow boil. You don't want to boil too hard or you've got more risk of them popping open. And you can test them just by feel but because this was fresh pasta it only took three or four minutes to cook realistically and I'd taken them down to like a thickness of two on the uh, one being the thinnest I didn't want to go to one because I didn't want to risk tearing them while I was using it so a thickness of two on the KitchenAid pasta roller thing uh, so once they're all cooked I just strained them and I didn't even get footage of how we ate them <laughs> So all I did to eat with them was I cut up some sausage pieces that I had into small pieces. I caramelized some onions, cooked the sausages off with the caramelized onion, added some sun-dried tomato and some coconut cream and a bit of garlic and a bit of butter and then mixed it all up into a sauce. And just we just did a spoonful of that over these nice big pillows of the kefir cheese ravioli. It was very tasty. Uh, the it's every time I make it I sit there and go oh you know it's worth the effort but it kind of isn't because it doesn't make huge amounts either like it's an hour and a half two hours work to make enough ravioli for eight people and even then it's a it's not a particularly large meal we'd be better off having it served with as a side to something uh, but it you know it it was still really tasty and it was a really nice way to use the kefir cheese so the rest of the kefir cheese is still in, sitting in the fridge the kids will probably just have it on flatbreads tomorrow uh, or I might make some sort of a pasta bake a bolognese pasta bake and use it as a layer in that I haven't decided yet but it sits in the ch in the fridge for a couple of weeks easily it's it's a fermented cheese so it doesn't go off quickly especially if you salt it before you stick it in there uh, so which I haven't done but I can do so thank you for joining me again today and I hope that gave you some insight into milk kefir and how we use it uh, and the ways it can be used and it's very simple because those kefir grains they just keep on growing so as so long as you look after your kefir you're going to have those grains forever so you just keep on adding them to your milk make sure they're made with fresh milk they're not left to sit for too long between feedings and things like that 
and then we'll just continue to grow and you end up with more. We do do water kefir as well and we do a second ferment of water kefir but we find it really difficult in our weather because the weather is so up and down and can be so hot it we struggle and we had uh, this issue where you couldn't either it was too fizzy or it wasn't fizzy enough or, or whatever else so we actually prefer to make a ginger beer with a ginger bug rather than the water kefir find it it works better for us but the again with the either a ginger bug or a water kefir you if you look after it you don't ever have to buy more to make it you just well I suppose you buy a bit more ginger but you know what I mean like it's not something that you it's an ongoing mother process that keeps on replenishing itself which is really great and the milk kefir is a bit the same way and the milk kefir works wonderfully in things like the uh, smoothie pops the frozen smoothie pops that I make uh, and all that sort of thing so anyway I've squirreled again haven't I so you know that's a bit of what I do it's just about every video these days lately uh, so I will see you on the next video and thank you very much for joining me bye guys